On the program right now from the Independent Women's Forum, Julie Gunlock. How are you, Julie? I can barely hear you over that music. Really? It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a Cam and Company dance party. I, I don't know. It was, it was fine for me. Maybe you were just feeling the groove a little bit more That's than right. I was. That's right. I was. I so oh. I so rarely get out these days. So. That that's that's the equivalent now of actually going to a dance club, right? Hearing hearing that music as your bumper <laughs> coming in. That's right. Fifteen seconds. All right, and then, <laughs> there, you yeah, there you go. All right, I went clubbing <laughs> today on uh, Cam and Company. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Yes, and to you. Has your uh, has your Twitter feed slowly become more inebriated as the uh, day goes on? <laughs> Indeed, but not not me, not yet. Um, no, I know it's always fun. The kids go to bed. It's always fun to you know be at work. And just look at your Twitter feed, and and gradually the spelling mistakes get more and more common. And I really love you guys, and I hate you, Twitter. And it's just, yeah. I have a strict no social media rule while drinking. That's a good rule. Yeah. It's uh, probably likely to keep you out of trouble. Yes, because I'm older. I mean, thank God there wasn't Twitter and Facebook when I was in college. Not that, I mean, not that I have too, you know, too much to... Regret, but uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm very glad all these things came about when I was a little older and a little wiser. You know, honestly, like if I tweeted while I was drinking 80% of the time, it would be, I'm so tired, I'm going to bed. <laughs> that would be, that would be my tweet. <laughs> yes, that, that would be mine too. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, let's talk about the uh, the dietary guidelines that are uh, coming out here. This is something you and I have been talking about off and on for months now because it's, right. it's, a, it's it really is a big deal. It, it, this is the federal government, in essence, coming out and saying, as the federal government, you're eating too much meat. Yeah, I mean, these things, these dietary guidelines, you know, I've actually kind of changed my tune on this. When I first started writing about this, I was like, these are ridiculous. Who cares what they say? But, you know, I, I didn't really fully understand that the, these um, dietary guidelines, they, they guide how the school lunch program is run, how our military eats, how SNAP benefits are allocated. So there's a huge taxpayer issue at that at work here. And secondly, um, people really pay attention to these things. I mean, I think it's ridiculous that people pay attention to these things, but they do. And so, um, so they do have a lot of influence. And now these, the latest Dietary Guidelines Committee is telling people, you should lay off the meat. You should switch to a plant-based diet. And it's really, really important that, that people know that they didn't make this recommendation because of health reasons. Uh, and, and they shouldn't have, because meat is a perfectly healthy part of a of, of a healthy diet, it's meat is perfectly fine on a healthy diet and is actually recommended. And the reason it's recommended is because meat carries a huge nutritional punch. In other in other words, you get a ton of vitamins and nutrients from one small piece of meat. Whereas if you're going to eat it, if you're going to eat vegetables, entirely a vegetable based diet, you have to eat a huge variety of things and you have to eat a lot more of it. And so it is, you know, meat is a very important and good part of a healthy diet. And so the reason that the Dietary Guidelines Committee is saying we need to switch to a plant-based diet, again, is not because of health reasons or the latest medical information. It's because of environmental concerns. So they are actually saying the reason you should switch to a plant-based diet has nothing to do with health. It's because you'll be a better citizen of the world. You'll take, you know, you'll take care of the earth if you stop eating meat. This is kind of outrageous. This shouldn't in any way... Um, be part of the dietary guidelines. It totally muddles the message. Um, th- this this guidelines committee is is required by law by Congress to only consider nutrition science. So again, they've really they've sort of gone over their mandate. This is out of their scope, and people should understand that before they you know go crazy and switch to a vegetarian diet. Yeah, I'm looking here at a story from uh, Philly.com, uh, written I think it was a Sunday in the Green Space section of the uh, website, Food Recommendations Take the Environment into Account. Uh, Eric yeah. Olson, Senior Strategic Director for Health and Food of the Natural Resources Defense Council. The fact is that the environment and health are inextricably connected. It's hard to say that if you're destroying the planet, you're doing oh. good things for health, Julie. Well, Why yeah, do you I- want to destroy the planet with your cheeseburgers and your ribs yeah. and your barbecue and yeah, your hot true. dogs? 
Yeah, it's absurd. And they're going to they're gonna continue to try to make that connection. Now, look, I'm not saying that we can't have a conversation about sustainable eating and sustainable farming and all of these sorts of things. If you want to have a conversation about that, God bless, go to town, rent a conference room, talk your little heads off. But the, the problem is, is that they're muddling this, they're mixing this with nutrition science, and there is nothing unhealthy about eating meat. There is absolutely nothing. And this is what really, really frustrates me the most, is that as I said earlier, meat really offers this huge nutritional punch. And when you've got people who live, you know, and they're really struggling with their food budgets, you know, if they integrate a small amount of meat into their diets, um, they're getting sort of all the complex nutrients that they need. Vegetarians, look, I, I you know, I, I, I'm some, in some ways I eat a lot like a vegetarian. I don't eat a lot of meat, but I... But you have to eat a wide variety of foods. You have to eat, you know, not only leafy greens, you have to eat beans, and you have to eat really complex, and, and again, a huge variety and a lot more food. You know, we have kids out there who, who you know, we always talk about, you know, obesity, but, we, but more importantly, kids need to get a balanced, wide variety of food, but they have, to get, they have to get certain nutrients, and meat offers that. And so when we recommend to people, when we tell them you really shouldn't eat meat, that's just a really – bad message, again, when the message is supposed to be about health and about a good way to eat. So this is, a, this is a, again, an agency that's, run total, that's gone totally amok and, again, is, is really letting environmental concerns outweigh health concerns. You know, uh, in, in, in perusing some of the, uh, the news stories uh, surrounding this issue, I ran across all kinds of uh, organizations, Julie, I didn't even know existed, the, uh, the Food Climate Research Network. Mm-hmm. Huh. Who yeah, knew? But, uh, uh, and and they talk about this study that, uh, uh, that, that I think you may have mentioned um, here, the, the, this new study out uh, that looked at the, quote-unquote, carbon footprints of the, uh, the food that we eat, and they found, yeah. yep, uh, meat and dairy, on average, have a higher carbon footprint than most plant-based foods, regardless of the uh, functional unit. But the the nutrient density uh, is a lot higher as well. And they also said the carbon footprint for processed vegetables and soups was considerably higher than uh, most other food products when the carbon footprint was calculated per 100 kcal and per nutrient density scores during the uh, uh, uh-huh. low calorie content of vegetables. Uh, so, so this is not, as you say, uh, as easy as well. If you want to save the planet, you just won't eat meat. Right. And, right. But but you know what, Julie, we're seeing this, frankly, all over the place. I mean, we have attempts right now to ban all centerfire rifle ammunition because if you don't, then you must want police officers to die. I mean, yeah. there, there are all yeah. kinds of these, as you say, extreme, uh, extremely stupid uh, arguments. The the you know these these extremely emotional arguments that if you don't agree with me, you're awful, Julie. Yeah, you're a and monster. I, and I have I have said for for years that I think. Since the sort of scandals of the climate change debate, whether it's the hockey stick, you know, all of that, that University of East Anglia kind of scandal that erupted a couple years ago, environment, and look, and also the economy tanking under Obama, you know, people just have not, you've seen on polls, people haven't cared that much about, like, climate change is just, in terms of people's, the issues that they care about, climate change just is not registering because people have other more important problems on their minds. And so I think environmentalists have really had to change things up. They've really had to sort of, like, widen their issue areas. And food is a big issue now. It, 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 environmental, environmental groups are now focusing a lot on food, on ag practices, and they are, are pushing this false narrative that farmers in this country are terrible, that farmers are destroying the country, um, that farmers are evil, big ag is evil. You've seen these sort of cartoons from companies like Chipotle and Whole Foods, and there's a new one out um, uh, that criticizes McDonald's. It's absolutely disgusting. The farmers in this country work so hard and provide this country and its citizens with cheap and available food, and it's just disgusting to me to see how farmers are are treated this way um, by these environmental groups. But again, I think a lot of it is because people are tired of sort of the climate change issue, and so they've had to expand. And now, they, again, they're um, they're criticizing farmers and the food industry. Talking with uh, Julie Gunlock of the Independent Women's Forum. So, when do these guidelines officially get released, Julie? Um, 
I don't know the exact date, but the next couple months. Um, but they're starting to leak things, and you know things like health intervention is showing up at your work. They should that, and schools that we should tax sodas and snack foods. That we should monitor people's television consumption. That we should send them texts when but this is government. Government sending people tests when they're eating too much. I mean, this is creepy. This is a rate so high on the creepy meter. I mean, this is the kind of stuff of government coming in and 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 really pushing you around. And again, it's nudge theory, right? It's pushing you. It's not nudging anymore. It's pushing you. If you're not going to do, if you're not going to eat the way Michelle Obama wants you to eat, they're going to push you to do it. They're going to come to your workplace. They're going to come to your school. I don't even know if parents are going to be notified of this. I mean, we have we we have a, um, a, a new story out today talking about criminalizing parents of obese children. Oh, in getting, Puerto Rico, I saw that yeah, story. It's getting really scary out there. This is this really is. I mean, if your kid is obese, you can be charged with child abuse. Yeah, absolutely no consideration of like sex, age, you know, the 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 um you know, anything that has to do with obesity. I mean, these kinds of government nitwits who propose these things who have absolutely no clue about you know, physiology or, or the science of obesity or the really complex issue of how our bodies metabolize things, they just say, oh, oh, oh it's, it's child abuse or, oh, it's soda or, oh, oh gosh, it's, it's school lunches. I mean, it, it really is exhausting and really, frankly, tiresome to watch these politicians propose legislation on very, very complex issues. Yeah, and, you know, here's the other thing that bothers me about this, Julie, is we were just talking about this, I think, uh, time before last that you were on. Uh, it's okay to eat uh, uh, butter now, right? I mean, every every right. few years, <laughs> yes. stuff changes. And so, you know, what you're going to, I mean, you, your child is obese because you've been feeding the wrong things, and therefore we're going to charge you with child abuse. And a couple of years later, your child was obese, even though you were feeding them the right things, but it still must be your fault somehow, so we're going to charge you, you know, I, this is... This is this really is the food police. It this, really, I mean, the, really the, the, is literally the food police. It literally, literally is the food police. And again, it's a way of telling parents, you better listen to us. You better do what you do. And it's and this is the kind of thing like you threaten parents with this kind of stuff. You're going to get parents that are even more eager to pass their kids over to, to, to government officials and give them the school lunch program, give them the school breakfast program, give them the school dinner program, because then my fingerprints aren't on it. You know, it is just, it's one of these ways in which they tell parents, you are part of the problem, you're going to be penalized, you might even have your kids taken away. What happens I mean, if your really... kid is eating three meals at school and they're still considered <laughs> obese? Right. Maybe that's maybe that's a way to get out of the charges. I mean, I don't know. But the point is, is that we're 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 constantly criminalizing parents, whether it's because they let their kid walk home, and that and that's the other thing. You know, you have you have parents who let their children walk home from a park less than a mile away. Here they are helping their kids burn off calories, <laughs> and they're they're almost arrested. I mean, parents can't win. Well. The good news is that in a couple of years, when the uh, Obamas leave the White House, I believe Michelle will be marketing a hamster wheel for children as part of uh, <laughs> Let's Move uh, uh, Incorporated. And, and so what will happen is you can keep your kids safely ensconced in your own home. You just, you just simply put them in the wheel. There'll be a locking door so they can't get out. And you just say, there's a calorie counter. And you say, Billy, you can get out when that reaches 500. Start running. Yes. Yes, and then they'll they'll have all treadmill desks at school. How's that sound, right? They'll just put them on little treadmills, these little low little low treadmills with desks attached. That's that's how kids should really be learning today. Can we bring back those those vibrating belts that just jiggled you and just uh, <laughs> install those in every desk? That would be wouldn't that be great if that worked? <laughs> All right, I'm Julie. in mine right now. I'm standing in one right now. <laughs> the time is melting off of me. <laughs> that would be fantastic if it worked. But, you know, yes. at least we get the uh, the old-timey film that we can laugh at. Uh, <laughs> oh, Grandpa, you were so silly. Listen, I appreciate you coming on the program. Enjoy St. Patrick's Day. Put the kids to bed at uh, 530 or so and have at it. <laughs> I will. I will. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Julie Gunlock joins us from the uh, Independent Women's Forum.